Kyle Laren to Galatasaray. Jordan Heidema is going to OL Reign and Deity Nabzi is heading to France. That's a lot of Canada. Hey everybody, welcome back to our One Soccer Canadians Abroad Summer Series. I'm Adam Jenkins filling in for Josh Deming. And if you are a fan of Canadian soccer, drop a like before we get going and hit that subscribe button as well. Ring the bell if you want to be notified at every time we upload a video so you never miss a piece of action from the world of Canadian soccer. Let's get right into it. It is officially silly season and the rumors are running rampant. Where will our Canadians abroad be playing next season? One of the largest exports of that rumor mill is Kyle Laren, who has been linked in the past to Olympiacos, Nottingham Force, where he would join up with fellow compatriot Richie Larea, and now most recently, Kyle Laren to fellow Istanbul side Galatasaray. Here's Peter Glinda with more on those rumors. Well, Galatasaray is at the moment, one of the front runners to land Kyle Laren from the sound of it. It was looking like Laren was heading towards the exit door at Besiktas, which now is very much the case. It looks like that's going to be happening with only a week or two left on his deal. There was a report out there from a couple of reliable Turkish outlets that said that Super League clubs could still make a push for him, whether that was Istanbul, Bashak Shahir, Galatasaray, or the like. Now, Galatasaray is one of the front runners to land him, which is interesting given the rivalry between the two clubs. However, when you look at the financial side of it, that could be the one obstacle here, as it could be with the other clubs outside of Turkey. Laren is still looking for about two and a half million euros net per season and a three year contract, whereas he was on about a million and a half maybe a little less than that at Besiktas with this current contract. So it's a pretty remarkable raise, but he does deserve it after the year he had last year. And even at times this year, he still put up some very solid underlying numbers. And given that they went through a couple of coaching changes, it wasn't on the whole a terrible season for Laren. And if he wants to get paid, that's totally his right. And he is more than within his right to do that. Now, there are many supporters that view this as more of a lateral move than a step up because, of course, Canadian supporters want to see their players in top five leagues. But something to keep in mind here is that doesn't always lead to more minutes, as we're seeing with Larea at Nottingham Forest. This is certainly something for Kyle to keep in mind, as there are a ton of things about these big time decisions, these career defining moments that these players have to consider. The prime of their careers aren't always that long, so they have to cash in when the opportunity is right even if that means ruffling some feathers along the way, which this would certainly do moving from Besiktas to Galatasaray. Keep in mind as well the World Cup and the playing time that makes it oh so important for Laren if he wants to crack into the Canadian fold. Let's go back to Peter for more. I would still say that if he can get a club on the continent, I'm talking in France, Italy, somewhere at that level, I think that could actually be the best landing spot for him. I know that he was linked constantly to clubs in the championship up until about January or February. But in terms of the actual fit tactically, I'm not so sure that he has the technique to be able to settle in England all that well. Whereas I feel like in France or Italy, he has the physical tools, I think, to actually thrive as just a solo number nine or as part of a strike partnership. Um, really the big obstacle though, is the financial side of it as it would be for Galatasaray or the other Turkish clubs that are linked to him because would they have the means to be able to pay him a couple million euros annually every year? I'm not so sure about that. But if it just came down to the simple tactical fit, I would say somewhere in Liga where he can thrive physically, uh, go up against some very solid defenders, or in Syria where I think they could utilize some of his intricacies very nicely in that he has good close control. He can build up well with the rest of his team, drop deep, play in a variety of different roles as a nine. After three seasons in France, Jordan Heidema is coming home. Almost. She's certainly coming a lot closer to home, the Chilliwack BC native playing for her de facto hometown club after having signed with OL Reign in the NWSL. The club owned by Olympique Lyonnais in France certainly provides Jordan with an opportunity to get a lot more playing time. Again, with the W Championship and a busy summer for our women's national team, these are very important things to consider. What it also means is there are soon to be some must-see Canadian Cascadian matchups 
with Jordan Heidema and Quinn taking on Christine Sinclair and Janine Becky in Portland. Now, we all know as much as we'd love it, Christine Sinclair is not going to play forever. That's not to say Jordan Heidema is the next Christine Sinclair, but she certainly has the ability to inject some life into this Canadian offense that the women's national team has been seeking for so very long. And the 21-year-old is currently in the national team camp ahead of their squads friendly against Korea Republic this Sunday in Toronto. And we had the chance to catch up with Jordan about her expectations for OL Reign and her general reaction to a big career move. I got into the point where I felt like it was time for me to move on. I just wasn't getting the minutes I wanted, so I was looking for more game time. Um, and so that was kind of like the biggest thing for me at the time. Um, and there was options um, and it just felt right um, with Seattle. It just all kind of stars aligned. You get that gut feeling, I think, as an athlete where you should and shouldn't go. Um, and that was kind of what I followed and I just trusted my instincts um, and just decided that that was the best place for me to move at the time. Um, and I stand by that for sure. And I'm really loving being in with the team. In one of the biggest moves in Canadian Premier League history, York United's Diadine Abzi is off to Poe in the French second tier. The four-year talisman has done everything he possibly can for the club, leading them in appearances, pitching in eight goals and nine assists over 6,000 minutes for YU. Here's Alexandra gange ruzik with more on this historic move for the CPL. Didi Nabzi has shown uh, time and time again in the Canadian Premier League that he's a very good talent. It always looked like he was uh, ready to make a, a push for, for a move, most likely in Europe, although he did uh, have MLS interest for sure during those uh, few seasons he was with York. So I think looking at those factors and just looking how young he is, uh, you know, still in his early 20s, so it's a lot, a lot of progression, a lot of development still to come for Diadine Abzi. There's no doubt this is an astounding move for Abzi, and it once again goes on to prove what Canadians can do when given the opportunity to shine. Now back with YU. They have one more match with Dating Abzi's services, the Canadian Championship semi-final in Vancouver against the Whitecaps. But after that match, there are some questions. What is next for York United, and how does Angus McNabb possibly try and fill the void that Abzi will be leaving? York are going to have a tough, tough job trying to fill the, the absence of Didi Nabzi, and understandably so. He's a, a special player in the sense that uh, he, he plays left back, he can defend like a left back, playing a back four, uh, but he just provides this offensive value that you don't see from many fullbacks. He's just consistently driving up the field, uh, off the ball, on the ball. He's a strong dribbler. He likes to whip in crosses, early crosses, cutbacks. Uh, he can also cut inside a little, has a dangerous shot. We've seen him score a few goals where he's just playing as almost a left winger, which, to be fair, is a role he used to play under Jimmy Brennan, where he was kind of like a left winger, would attack guys one-on-one -on -one and score. But now, under Martin Nash, he was playing as a left back, as he used to under Brennan uh, before, and he's also doing a job there. So I think given his versatility, given what he can bring on the wings, that's not an easy, you know, hole to, to fill because you're, you're, you 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 want to fill in what he's able to to, to accomplish defensively. Uh, part of one of the back uh, best, if not the best, back lines in the CPL this year, at least statistically. York, uh, they've more had their struggles on the offensive end, but he can also contribute at the other end. That's not an easy uh, player to to replace, and I think it'll be interesting to see how York goes about fixing that 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 hole that. While they'll be happy to move Abzi on for, for a fee, it's not someone that uh, is easy to replace, that's for sure. Now, the Montrealer is already catching headlines from around the world and certainly in the Canadian national fold. From futsal to the U23 side that competed in the last Olympic qualifying cycle. But now there are some more expectations. And the question is, what can Abzi do in Ligue 2? I think this is a, a level where he can certainly do some damage. I mean, he's going to come in. Uh, he's going to have a chance to, to get a preseason with Pau, get a chance to find his legs, and then just continue to grow each game in in and out. So if he if he gets the minutes that uh, you know he needs to develop, there's no reason why he can't adapt to the league to level and then go from there. Given his age, his profile, and what he's shown in the CPL. We, of course, congratulate and wish all the best to Diadine Abzi and also a special tip of the cap to former Cavalry FC midfielder Victor Latoury, who was announced on Tuesday as the newest member of Ross County in the Scottish Premiership. We cannot wait to see what these two Canadians do over the Atlantic.
And that is not our only piece of British news on the day as we have to talk about Daniel Jebison. Now, some social media sleuthing has revealed that Jebison has taken any mention of Canada or the Canadian flag out of his Twitter and Instagram bios. And he has also mentioned how excited he is for the upcoming U19 Euros where he'll be participating in for England. Now, Jebison is the latest dual national to declare or suggest Canada is out of the picture, joining Marcelo Flores, who committed to Mexico, as well as Stefan Mitrovic, who is now playing his trade for Serbia after refusing to switch allegiances to Canada the last time he was brought into camp and really finding himself down in the Canadian depth chart. We also have to spare a thought for Luca Kalesho, who was brought into the last Canadian international window, and we all know the drama and controversy that surrounded that. A lot of supporters were asking the question, what impact, if any, would that window, the cancelled friendlies, the pay dispute have on he and other Canadian dual nationals? This conversation has quieted down somewhat as many of the players have gone on vacation, but it is certainly not the last that we'll hear of it. Jebison in particular is not insignificant as the 18-year-old has been lighting it up with Sheffield United earning regular first team minutes and also pitching in a ton of offense on loan for Burton Albion. Now we have to start talking about the NWSL in this episode of our summer series, in particular, Janine Becky and Michelle Prince thriving in NWSL play. Janine Becky is a superstar. That's not breaking news, but it is definitely worth repeating. She continues to do magical things with her new club in Portland this weekend, having an interception and then sending in a perfect delivery to set up the Thorns match winning goal and what would move on to be a 6-0 thrashing of Chicago at the weekend. The 88 times capped Canadian international has started seven of her nine matches since joining the Thorns and has pitched in two assists on the season. And Becky is not the only Canadian international turning some heads in NWSL. Michelle Prince of Houston has continued to find the highlight reel herself, especially her right-footed curler. That would also be the match winner for Houston this weekend as they hung on for a narrow 4-3 victory over North Carolina. And all this for Michelle is coming off the back of a very impressive hat trick and don't look now, but Nichelle currently finds herself in fourth in the NWSL Golden Boot Race with five goals on the season. And we'll hope that Janine and Nichelle can bring their form from club play to the national team. They as well being with the Canadian women's national team in camp in preparation of their friendly against Korea this Sunday. Staying with our women's national team, and we have to talk about some news from off the pitch as well. Levy Quebec's Gabrielle Carl has voiced her opinion as well on this ongoing and important conversation about equal pay between the women's and men's national teams. In an article on RDS, the 23-year-old had a few very important quotes. By choosing to pass off these unequal situations as normal, we continue the cycle of discrimination and we take away the chance for female athletes to prove that they have a place at the top by offering them fewer opportunities than those afforded to male athletes. I'm not asking for millions on my doorstep tomorrow morning, far from it, although several players who have contributed to the success of Canadian soccer for more than a decade richly deserve it. The men's team has good intentions and we stand with them in their battle to be justly compensated. But from our standpoint, the women's team needs more than an equitable structure. We need equal pay. There are several important distinctions to keep in mind here when discussing equity, equality, equal pay and percentages. For a very simplistic example, if the men's national team receives $1,000 in compensation for the same tournament that the women's national team play in, but they only get $500. If we're working with equal percentages, the men would get $500 and the women would get 250. That is equal percentages, but it is not equal pay for equal work. And that is a very important nuance to remember in these discussions. Surely this isn't the last we've heard from our women's national team players, but one thing is clear here. They are very much aligned on their messaging and what they're trying to accomplish, not just for themselves, but as they repeatedly state for generations of women's national team players to come, especially with the windfall of 2026 right around the corner. Finally today, Canada learned which cities will be hosting matches in the 2026 World Cup. I'd ask for a drum roll, but we know the answer. But in case you missed it, it is Vancouver and Toronto. Edmonton was left out of selection from FIFA. And while it's disappointing to many Edmontonians, especially after what they did to create an incredible atmosphere at the Azteca, there is certainly some reasons to understand why FIFA decided to go in a different direction. CTV's Kevin Nimick tweeted the following after Edmonton learned that they would not be hosting matches. 
The government of Alberta took the unusual step of demanding Edmonton host at least five of Canada's 10 allotted World Cup games. It also demanded Edmonton host two round of 32 or round of 60 knockout games. That is a pretty high ask from the Albertan capital and it almost borders on delirious. On a more positive note, BMO Field has unveiled their renderings for the upcoming expansion and they are gorgeous. The exhibition place site will add an additional 17,756 seats, bringing the total capacity to nearly 46,000. We can be excited for November, but after Thursday's announcement, it's hard not to think ahead to 2026. The match splits and the competition stages were not yet announced, though Christian Jack was able to get a pretty juicy piece of information out of CONCACAF president Victor Montaliani in his one-on-one -on -one interview from Thursday's big announcement. It was part of our bid, uh, we're still committed to it, uh, that there'll be an opener in Canada, uh, there'll be an opener in the US and an opener in Mexico uh, on the same day. So Day one of the World Cup. Day one World Cup, three opening matches. And one in Canada for sure. One in Canada, yes. And what do we know about the games, Vic? I know originally it said 60-10-10 split. Is that yeah. still a commitment? Yeah, still a commitment. But, you know, again, the match schedule, we'll see where it goes, but that's still the commitment. Now, while we await for the official schedule to drop with the venues on which days, it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out that Canada hosting on day one means Canada will be playing on home soil to open the 2026 World Cup. We don't know whether that will be Vancouver or Toronto, but we do know it will be a massive celebration and a day to remember for a very, very long time. Clearly another very busy week for our Canadians abroad, and now you are all caught up on the latest. If you're enjoying our Canadians Abroad Summer Series, please make sure you give this video a like, subscribe while you're down there so you never miss an upload as we keep you caught up on all things Canadian soccer. For Josh Deming, I've been Adam Jenkins. We will see you next time on Canadians Abroad.